Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. Today's guest is Mark Limbaga. Mark is a strength and conditioning coach for the Philippines boxing team. He's also a Strong First Level 2 kettlebell instructor and Strong First bodyweight instructor. In this episode, Mark and I discuss what it's like to balance programming and training for athletes such as boxers who are under a high state of stress while keeping them fresh and recovered. Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's episode. Mark, welcome and thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be here, Joe, and thanks for inviting me over. Yeah, my pleasure. So, Mark, um, let's kick things off. Let's have you talk a little bit about your uh, your background and your story, how uh, you got to to this point in the the health and fitness industry, um, and what brought you here. All right. So, my name is Mark Limbaga. I'm a Strong First uh, Level 2 kettlebell instructor and a Strong First bodyweight instructor. I am also the senior head, uh, senior coach for Eclipse Gym. I am in charge of the Shaw branch because we have two branches, one in Mandaluyong, which is a part of the Metro Manila, and one in Man- uh, Main Manila. So that's it. And I'm also the strength and conditioning coach for the Philippine boxing team. Excellent. And how long have you been working um, with the Philippine boxing team? I have been in the team since 2012. Oh, great. Excellent. So four years now. Awesome. So yeah, how has, um, when you first started working with the boxing team, um, and you took over, what was, what type of training were they doing? And then what are they doing now? Uh, How did, how has it changed? Um, and what, what was the state of the athletes? Were they, um, having a lot of success or were they having a lot of injuries? Well, when I first took over, the first thing I did is I observed because I wanted to see how they were uh, being trained by my predecessor. And then I also uh, wanted to observe like how they trained since I did some boxing on uh, myself uh, as a hobby. I said, I want to see what was uh, what I'm going to be working with. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I noticed was they were doing some sort of resistance training. But they also had a lot of injuries. So I said, all right, the first thing that we could do is if I could lower their injury rate, probably even by a meager, quote unquote, temp- meager 10%, then I'm sure we're going to be uh, doing some uh, some things better. So that's what the first thing I did is, all right, let's uh, slowly uh, make some adjustments. So I noticed that uh, the injury rate started to drop and I said, all right, we're on to something. And then... I started uh, adding more things as uh, my craft improved, so to speak, the more stuff I learned and unlearned, of course, I constantly look to refine the way we train. So right now we're focusing more on body weight stuff, adding some barbell and kettlebell work as needed. But the first thing I always say is we are not trying to create uh, monsters in the gym. We're trying to create guys who compete at the elite level and stay healthy as possible. Yeah. And that's, that's such a crucial component is, um, maintaining health because that's, what's going to allow you to have the steady, consistent training and yield the the long-term results. Oh yes, definitely. So, um, what are some of the the things you put into place to help reduce, uh, the injuries on the, on the team? Well, one thing that I did is I, uh, right now I was, I, focused more on teaching them the resets found in uh, original strength. And I also tried to focus on teaching them how to slow down movements because mostly for athletes, they always are on full throttle, but sometimes they forget that before you can accelerate, you have to have a good level of control. So let's say sometimes they would be uh, doing push-ups and they're going fast, but you see their backs are arching or their elbows and shoulders are flaring out. So sometimes I'd purposely tell them, slow down. Or sometimes I would purposely uh, cut down their training volume when they do their se- their sessions with me. 
so that that would allow them to recover better. Yeah, so making sure they're they're taking a step back, regressing to progress for, for the long term. Oh, yeah, that's right. Sometimes we need to regress in order to progress. So um, in terms of um, what you were doing with them at, at the beginning when you when you first started working with the team four years ago, um, and you mentioned it, it's, you know, it can often be typical athletes are, they only have one gear. They only know one speed and that's, you know, full throttle all the time. So getting them to slow down, um, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, wh- what did you do? Was it just teaching them how to kind of move better or teach them different movement patterns in terms of squatting or hinging or using their original strength resets so that they kind of gained more awareness through their movement? You basically just took the words out of my mouth, using original strength resets, teaching them how to squat better, teaching them how to hinge better. And I would say, like recently, I was up at the National Training Center because to give guys an idea, uh, I'm here in Quezon City, which is uh, part of Metro Manila. And they're up in Baguio, so it's, it's, high, it's about a mile or, or, or two above sea level. And it's about a 250-mile uh, distance. So since they're there, I travel to the center at least once. Someone's like, uh, yeah, I think I was there two weeks ago. And what I focused on is, all right, guys, I'm going to lead the warm-up. And the first thing I did is, all right, let's see, can you diaphragmatically breathe? Because we know that sometimes people tend to be in uh, stress stress uh, slash fight or flight mode often, especially in their case. All right, let's allow you to shift into rest and digest mode. So, all right, the first thing I did is, okay, guys, let's see how you breathe. And within about five or 10 minutes, a few of the guys who are learning how to belly breathe, which is one of the uh, best things I've seen in a while, or uh, since I know that, all right, they got, at least they got one thing down. If this is the only thing they'd get during this trip, then I'm happy. And then afterwards the next thing we did was all right i found a, a long bench i think it's a, it was about an eight or ten foot bench all right guys let's crawl on the bench now you're not going to be able to crawl fast here so you're going to really have to slow down and own the movements and then i saw a lot of them moving a lot better uh towards the end of the session and then they some of them uh, when i was teaching them some rolling patterns said that oh my shoulders are a bit better now they feel good uh, earlier uh in the day they were really tight yeah, that's great. It sounds like you were you were able to step back, observe the group as a whole, and then really kind of tailor what what resets they needed uh, to get them moving a lot better. Right now, it's not. I wouldn't really say tailor. I put them through a, a, a series of movements that I I handpicked, and I would see if they need to make some adjustments. If a guy can't do a certain rolling pattern, I would give him a regression and then see if that works, and then take it from there. I'll, I'm just always looking for a safe entry point, and then making adjustments uh, as needed. Because, of course, some people pick up movements quickly. Some people uh, need to regress and then work with that regression until they can own it and then you t- uh, take them up a level. So how do you how do you find that safe entry point? What do you look for? Well, very good question. I always look for uh, is there integrity of the, in the movement, uh, especially when you're going at a slow pace because you really have to uh, – show that you can control the movement uh, step by step, mm. especially when you're doing it slow. You, can, you should demonstrate uh, mastery or, or I would say ownership of the movement. Then if I see that, then all right, I could add a little more. Let's say you, uh, I'm trying to teach you how to uh, segmental roll, but you you have coordination issues. So I would I would break it down and then see if it, it, do they really have uh, an issue or they just need to learn uh, the movement and you have to just coach them because it's a, it might be a cognitive issue. If then, uh, if, it, if it's just that you need to cue them through the movement, then it's fine. Because uh, one thing I could tell you is usually when you're dealing with athletes who are at the top level, they have a really high level of body awareness. But sometimes they just, they just lose it because they, for, they forgot how to do it. So, But then if you coach them or cue them, they get it right away. That's great. So you, you found with the, the boxing team in particular – that you just sort of need to help them kind of get into the right, uh, you know, get into the right place, so to speak. Uh, and they, things usually yeah. fall into place. That's awesome. Yeah. So just kind of 
stepping back, you mentioned uh, a minute or two ago about about the diaphragmatic breathing, and this is something that is talked kind of very widely at this point across the across the the health and fitness industry. But in particular, uh, uh, hold, yeah. hold up. Uh, may, may interview lang po ako, ah. May interview lang ako. See, right. Yes, my father-in-law was just asking for. Uh, I said I'm just doing a podcast. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. Right, carry on. So, um, in particular for for boxers, uh, mm-hmm. breathing is super important because as they're as they're getting ready to strike, they're they're setting themselves up to be to be bracing, right? Yep. So for them, it's um, it kind of takes on a little bit of a different meaning because they're bracing to potentially absorb an impact. Whereas, you know, when we think of it, we're doing it for, for a lift, we're doing it to add some, you know, uh, stability and and spinal stiffness while we're under Mm -hmm. load. Mm -hmm. That's right. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Like what, what are, you know, what are some of the things besides the, the original strength resets, but you look for in particular with, with a boxer, maybe compared to somebody that might just be a regular client um, because the breathing is s- such an intricate part of the, the sport of boxing. Well, I'll be very honest. The one thing that I always look for is that I always look for, can they breathe properly? Number one, number two, can they stabilize? And then I would, I, some of them, they could really, uh, stabilize when they're doing squats, but then when you put them in a push-up, they lose it. And there are others for the other way around. So I would always see like, all right, uh, how much control can you have with load, without load? And when we're doing our ab exercises, are you properly engaging the, your abdominals rather than just trying to go through the movement that you're actually using your lower back and our hip flexors to do the movement? So that's one thing that I always emphasize on them is that what you're doing is fine. Uh, it's great, but let's see uh, when we at, when we slow it down when we at, when we learn how to do it better. I always tell them that just do it, do it better. Uh, can you still do it? Because if you can't do it uh, better, what if you can't do it with uh, with a slower pace or when you're required to do it a certain way? Then okay, then we have that's let's fix it. There's nothing wrong with relearning things. I always I always say that uh, we want to be able to move properly. And not move with compensations. Yeah, and that and that goes right back to what you said earlier about making sure that they they own that movement. And um, the other thing that you you said was, that was really interesting is you noticed differences. Um, specifically, you said squat versus the push up, right? So yep. the uh, the athlete might be able to stabilize doing one type of exercise, but but may not be able to stabilize in another exercise. And do you find that's for, for these, these athletes, they're obviously towards the higher end of things. Is that because they don't have the, the awareness? They're not thinking about sequencing things properly together or they just can't do it for that particular movement. Among all of them, uh, this is I know this is a joke among all races that since we're Asian we should be able to squat, but uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, there were there were there are some that they had some difficulty when it comes to the squat, so we did some drills and then that uh, kind of as you said aided them and reminded them about some of the things that you should do when you squat, and then they got it. With the push up, it's usually all right. Uh, let's it, they could crank out so many push ups, but you know that they're not really quote unquote proper push up. So all right, let's control it. Let's slow it down. And then let's not worry about getting as many reps. Let's see how many good reps you could uh get and then let's build on that. As I have there there are I think two or three at the top of my mind, uh mm-hmm. among all of the boxers who could really do I would say advanced push ups. Like two of them guys could do a one arm one leg push up if I if I coach them through it. Then one of our uh, female boxers could do one arm push ups like nothing. So you could see they have the strength. So they just need to work on their skill. That's that's excellent. That's great. So 
for um, for these athletes when you're when you're working with them, um, what are you know what are some staple um, you know benchmarks that you have in mind? Um, so obviously you mentioned that you you're using body weight and barbells and, and kettlebells and everything, but is there sort of a standard for uh, men and women that you're you're trying to get them to hit? That's kind of like you know in your mind is a good baseline. Uh, good question. I recently had this discussion with the sports science team because we brought in a new guy recently. He's supposed to be like their performance enhancement guy or performance eva- uh, performance uh, evaluation guy, and he uses different types of systems. And we kind of look at things differently. I would rather focus on the qualitative thing rather than the quantitative thing, though those things have their place. Don't get me wrong. I, uh, for me, what I would always look for is, okay, uh, if I put you through a crawling pattern, can you do it properly and with control? And if for lower body, can you do do at least a, uh, sit in a squat? And if I make you do a goblet squat with a, let's even with a 16 kilo kettlebell, can you do at least five Properly executed goblet squats. Can you do at least five dead ha- dead hang pull ups? Those things. I mean, and then I would also check. Uh, can you? Is your segmental role at least acceptable? Because I remember. I think that was two years ago. We uh, we worked with the Olympic uh, Commission here, and they were put through a movement screen, which is very popular. And then I asked the guy. The guy goes up to me and he says. Do you know about the screen? And said, "Oh yeah, one of them." I said, "One of their the guys who are actually lecturers, a good friend of mine." And the guy looked at me like a deer in headlights, and I said, "Well, okay, let's hope this doesn't turn out bad." Apparently, these guys were just doing doing the screen, but they really were just doing the screen for the sake of screening, not looking for red flags. And they were put through a workout, which looks like mo- what you would see in most commercial gyms, where they're just trying to put uh, the client into a uh, in, into a pool of sweat afterwards, or in some cases, you see some vomit on the side, which, in my my opinion, is not what you want to look for when you're trying to train an athlete. Right, right, yeah. the The workout, quote unquote, is yeah. Yeah, that's just the result of the training session. That's not the the purpose of of the session. That's not why you're there. Yes, you would if you want to get smashed or you want to get tested. I think that's where the competitions come in. That's where, where their fight camps come in. Not when they are doing their strength and conditioning. That is to prepare them for the rigors of their sport. Yeah, and that's that's a really important point. I mean, can can you take a moment and kind of talk about that difference between? Um, and we talk a lot about this in the Strong First community of viewing training as a practice versus you know a workout. And yeah, what what is the difference, and why is it important to take that uh, that mindset? All right, let's basically use uh, two types of stress, quote unquote. There's use stress, which is a good type of stress, and then there's distress, which is basically the body say, kind of giving out a signal, not all right. We need to slow down. We need help. At, at to a certain degree, now you will not really develop much thing, much uh, progress. You will not develop anything, in my uh, personal opinion, if you just focus on smashing the body versus when when you. Uh, when you would take the time and really try to hone and polish some skills. Uh, to quote one of our fellow Strong First instructors, Alex Salkin, he said, you will not learn anything if you go to school and every time you go to class, you are given a test. So one of the best ways to develop any type of skill would be to take time and to really master or get proficient in in that skill and then slowly and incre- incrementally add a little challenge, not too much that the body starts to see it as a threat rather than, all right, I can, I could still manage this. And then you slowly check up, turn up the volume rather than turn up the volume all at once. Right. I mean, just a simple example is if I, let's say plugged in my iPod to this, uh, my speakers and I turn out the volume, turned up the volume to level 10 right away, I would feel like my eardrums are going to blow out of my head. But if I started at level one and I slowly (laughs) turn it up, I think I could manage of course, but you get to a when you get to like a le, like a level eight or nine, you'd probably turn into this grumpy old man screaming at the teenagers. Turn that damn music down. 
<laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, that, that's yeah. that's a very good analogy to kind of uh, paint that picture between, you know, when you show up to do a training session, are you just beating the crap out of yourself or yeah. is it a thoughtful, engaged practice where you're trying to enhance your, your skill and ability? Yeah, you're try- when you're trying to enhance something, you have to give it time. You have to let the that let the adaptation take its place. Uh, I actually said this to some of the guys at the gym where I work for, and I said, think about it this way. Look at all the apex predators. Look at a lion, look at a python, or look at a crocodile. You would never see any of these predators barge right in to attack their prey. They want to make their kill as flawless, as effortless, as swift as possible. And then so they could they could live uh, feed survive that survive and then go on you will never see them barge you would never see like a lion barge right into a wildebeest head on that's asking for uh, it's asking him to get, to get he wants to get killed if he does that or you won't even see a crocodile like jump right on, out of the water and try to get that get that that, that that uh wild boar or that deer it has everything is time is precise and cal- calculated if you don't uh focus on precision you don't focus on uh, being calculated when you train in the same manner you're asking for a disaster right and that's that's some great perspective there we can learn so much from uh from mother nature oh yeah definitely so how many athletes on the team uh are you working with in total from what i remember cuz i was talking to our um administrative secretary i think a month and a half ago and he i was asking about how many guys are in the roster at the moment and he said there are 40 slots and i think that there are i i believe 30 or 32 i know that the women's team is down to eight right now uh two boxers recently decided to leave and do other things uh i think the men's team yeah we are they're about 20 22 the junior team is about eight so yeah, so almost forty. Oh wow, yeah. So that's you got quite the uh, yeah. quite the pool of athletes you're working yeah. with. Now, yeah, what are the age ranges? You mentioned juniors, so obviously you're you know adolescent teenagers, and then yeah. mid to mid to late twenties, early thirties. Yeah, uh, the the junior team, the youth, the youth teams team starts from fifteen to seventeen. Once you're eighteen. Uh, you're considered an adult, you already move up to the senior team. So uh, what we what we do is we uh, separate their trainings. They're all given at least two to three coaches per division. So the senior men's team has three coaches, the women's team has three coaches, the junior team has three coaches, and they have their schedules. So let's say the women, the, the men's team, the senior team has their session every Tuesday and Thursday with me, but I'm usually just there just Tuesdays. Uh, once a month, so then I leave the program with the coaches. So uh, their their training session is at ten. Then the women's team is at eleven. The junior team, since some of them are still going to school, it's usually between three p.m. to five p.m. depending on when they're all all available. Wow. Okay, that's <laughs> that's a lot to juggle there. Um, yeah. And you can you imagine the last time I was there, uh, I led three teams through a warm up. So I got a workout in. For, through that day and I still had to do my own thing. Oh yeah. So you were, you were getting a lot in on that, that day. Oh yeah. I got my practice. Thanks to them. <laughs> nice. So, um, can you talk a little bit about because you're working with juniors, um, and then some athletes that might be a little bit more experienced and older, how does your programming vary for athletes that are younger compared to the more experienced ones? Okay. Uh, what I did recently is uh, with the junior team, some of them tend to have pretty impressive endurance versus some of the sen- senior guys. So there were always outliers from each of the, the different uh, teams. But what I did with the junior team is I wanted to focus on building a little more stability in some of their movements and then slowly adding more strength. Since some of them are still growing and they still they're still not hitting their strength spurts yet so all right we would just focus on let's say doing more push-ups and then improving the quality of their push-ups versus when i'm training the senior team most of them 
can already do a good number of push-ups. All right, so what we're doing now is can we progress from doing a push-up to doing a one-arm push-up? Or for some of this, uh, the men, I would work on doing more advanced uh, unilateral work, like working up to pistols. And in fact, if you, for those who are on my social media accounts, I think I posted an album there two, two years ago or a year and a half ago. You would see pictures of some of the men doing pistols. Wow! So you have a lot of different abilities across the the uh, age groups, um, and we'll make sure that uh, when we publish this episode, we link to uh, those YouTube videos that you mentioned. I'll get those links from you after afterward. Yeah. Um, so for the younger athletes. You're focusing on developing a little bit more stability because they're still developing as a human being. How do you do that? What do you? What exercises are you having them do to to make sure that they're reflexively stabilizing through the core musculature, yeah. and then they have a good solid foundation underneath of them to really lay that strength on top of. Here's something that would surprise you. Most of the junior uh, guys, when I work with them, their crawling patterns uh, need more work versus some of the senior guys. So recently, uh, that's what I've been focusing on, is uh, focusing more on, uh, I would say, the crawling patterns. And in fact, uh, I have this vi- uh, this video on my Instagram, which still cracks me up, because I was having them do uh, neck, uh, neck nods as a cool down. And you could see two boxers head to head, and they were doing neck nods synchronized. And I, and I put a caption there saying, trying to avoid eye contact. So <laughs> that's basically it. Okay. All right. So um, for, for, the, for the adolescents, right? So for the younger boxers, uh, how long does it, does it take for them to get up to speed? I, I, I find that kind of interesting that you mentioned that they have a harder time with the crawling. Is that are they more sedentary compared to um, you know their teammates that are older? Um, I wouldn't say so, but perhaps I might just factor this in since some of them are still going to school. Of course, yeah, and you have to sit in classes. That probably factors in. Versus mm-hmm. some of the senior boxers, usually when uh, they're not in training, if they're not taking naps, they probably go go to the ta- go to town. And that's where they do their personal errands when they have to buy some stuff. They have to go to the bank and send money to their relatives in their provinces. So they're probably moving just a little bit more than the the adolescents right now. And that's a good guess of mine. But to be honest, my guess is as good as yours. Hmm. Yeah, I find that very interesting because usually you you would think that the younger individuals would still be tapping into yeah. some, some of those neurodevelopmental movement yeah. patterns much more exactly. than the older ones. But you're, you're actually finding the opposite. Yeah, uh, that's, why, that's why I said my guess is probably because the juniors are still in, in school, so some of them have to sit in classes. Yeah. And you know how it is when you're in college. Sometimes you have a uh, three-hour span where you're taking three one-hour classes. So you're sitting sitting for three hours. Now, that may not sound like much compared to – an office worker, but for someone who doesn't sit as much, you'd see the effects of sitting more in a person uh, who sits more versus a person who doesn't, who sits less. Right. Right. So when you're, when you're working with, uh, with the team, mm-hmm. what's a, what's a typical training month or training week look like for them? Are you ah. focusing more on you know volume, uh, conditioning, um, yeah. building building max strength? Well, since we're, our equipment is very limited, uh, so we just have just have to focus on uh, a lot of body weight stuff and, and some kettlebell work. Uh, what we and, and we have some medicine balls. Uh, what I would normally do is all right. I would focus on doing uh, some ori- original strength resets, and then I would try to load some of the resets. So. One of my favorite ways to build up their strength and their stability at the same time would be if I make them do some crawls, I would have them drag a kettlebell. That's one way. And I'm actually planning, since some of them are already heading to the Olympic trials soon, uh, qualifiers actually, I might have them do a vertical bird dog. If you saw that article by Dan John on the Dragon Bar Forum. And I might also do have them do some 
as a cooldown or part of their uh, finisher circuits that uh, some the coach one of our co- uh, consultant coaches uh, had them do before, which we uh, haven't been incorporating for a few years now, is probably have them do dead bugs up up against the wall when you have to press against the wall. So they would actually be able to learn to activate some of the muscles that are kind of not uh, firing off the bat. So I'd probably have them do that. And when they were still here, we have we had a we have a gym in Manila, which we were there for the longest time until they had to move up to Baguio. So what I might make some of them do as well is ha- probably review uh, their Turkish getups because they haven't been doing that in a while. Yeah, so you're you're having them go through a lot of ground based movements. Um, yeah, because whether- they're they're standing all the time. Right. It's not. Yeah. So why? I mean, mm-hmm. just focusing on something that you don't do but is still beneficial would definitely help what you do all the time. So if you're on the ground all the time, let's say like for guys who are doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Judo, or wrestling, perhaps by sta- doing some standing movement, it would complement your ground your ground, and vice versa. Since I'm, the boxers are always standing all the time in a fixed stance, perhaps just doing more groundwork will also help them more. That's That's outstanding. That's great. So, and I, I love the the loaded crawls. I just got um, about a week and a half ago. I got my original strength infinity strap, so I've been yeah. starting to use that for some loaded farmers carries and loaded crawls. And yeah, it's it's amazing. So I, I've worked up to you and I have chatted uh, yeah, yeah. off the podcast, but broken the five minute barrier of con- yeah. uh, continuously crawling. But then you add load to it, and it's like yeah. it's like starting from ground zero all over again. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I always have uh, my uh, original strength loop in my backpack, and I also have the strap. So whenever I go up to this uh, to Baggy for uh, to train the boxers, I always have that uh, in my backpack just in case I want to get some loaded crawling in. Because one of the things I don't have uh, regular access to here is I don't have a track oval over there. They have a track oval, and uh, just to uh, give you something juicy to uh, consider, I think. Yeah, the last time I trained the boxers uh, before my most recent trip, the last trip I had November last year, when I taught them some loaded carries, they actually did a lot better than me with their goblet carries than I would. But then when it came to crawling, that's where they struggled. Something to think about. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Do you think that has to do with them, uh, you know, getting into that type of position for for the uh for the boxing they're they're kind of getting into more yeah. of a that that squat pattern versus being on their hands and uh knees yeah. and feet okay yeah i i think so because they're standing more so i think it's easy they're they're probably more accustomed to standing and walking or running because they have road work in the morning mm-hmm. versus uh crawling right so kind of zooming out now Right. How does yeah. training for a boxer or, or a fighter uh, vary compared to, you know, let's say uh, an endurance athlete, like a runner? How, how would you yeah. approach training them differently? And what do you make sure that you, you really um, emphasize with, with a boxer or a fighter? With the boxer, most boxers are always hurting in, in, in a certain joint. It's either their shoulder hurts or let's say their knuckles hurt, which is of course due to the impact of the punches. Some of them also have uh, tight hip flexors. So I have to work with those versus a runner. I don't think we do. We definitely would not hurt. Uh, they wouldn't be hurting on the knuckles unless they do something really crazy, which is probably not related to the sport. <laughs> right. Right. So they're, they're taking much more impact you know, from, yep. from the physical blows compared to an endurance athlete, which is tends to be more on the either poor movement quality through a movement pattern or repetitive motion of the, of the yep. sport. Okay. Yeah. But remember, box, runners also take impact on their joints. Cause when, when you, each stride creates force to, to the ankle, to the knee, to the hip. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's still, so, uh, one of my good friends actually uh, and colleagues, uh, Ted Reseda once uh, said a few years ago to me, "Remember that running is a contact sport because there is impact when you when you run. It's just that it's not 
given to you by an opponent. Wow, that's that's a great quote right there. I mean, that is some amazing perspective because we don't really think of it that way at all, do we? We think of it as yeah, a non, non-contact sport, but the truth of the matter is there's actually a tremendous amount of force that's being transferred from the ground up through our body. Oh, yeah, definitely. So how, how do you, taking into what you just said, um, the amount of trauma that their, their body is absorbing from, you know, practice and sparring and then the, the, um, the boxing matches, what do you, do you sometimes feel like you need to kind of make sure that they're getting in quality repetitions and you're not as concerned with volume or conditioning because they're, they're doing so much that's physically breaking them down and you kind of have to be very mindful of, of, um, how to progress them so they're they're not going to get injured. Yes, actually that's what I usually want to focus on is I would rather cut down on their volume. Just let uh, my session with them serve as like an active recovery session rather than a beatdown. Because you said that they get a lot of volume in their sparring sessions and in their, their, uh, focus mitt and their heavy bag sessions, they already got a lot of volume there. So what we need to do is let their body recover and focus on uh, develop, re- redeveloping or enhancing their reflexive stability and reflexive strength. Beautiful. Um, so, so what are, do you have any specific, I, I know you've mentioned crawls, um, yeah. you know, the body weight exercises, is there any specific ones for fighters that are absolute go-tos that regardless of, you know, being a, a junior or more experienced, you, you, there, it's a staple across all your programs that every, every athlete is doing it. Yeah. Well, right now I have everyone crawling. I am also teaching them more loaded carries because these things are the loaded carry. I love it because it's a, it's such a low skill movement. It gives you a lot more than it takes from you. I am also slowly teaching them how to do dead bugs and uh, one leg deadlifts. Okay. And now I, I'm actually slowly starting to teach them some uh, regressions to rolling, like uh, doing a windshield wiper or a half roll. In fact, uh, during one of the sessions that uh, after I was there, that was a Wednesday morning, right after their road work, when they were told to uh, do their cool downs, I remember I was te- I was using that as an opportunity to, to go around and help some of them re- review some of the things we did or teach them something new. So there was this one boxer who was kind of trying uh, to roll around and said, Hey, let me show you something cool. And I showed him uh, an elevated roll. And I actually posted a picture of that on his Instagram, on my Instagram. And it was a, it was pretty good. I mean, for someone who just relearned or learned it, he was doing it right. And then I was uh, even uh, seeing uh, this other boxer doing us uh, trying to do segment rolling uh focusing on the lower body and i liked it because i i said I, for me if they do these things and they focus on that even when i am not around and it becomes part of what they were do, uh, their routine even if it's for a cool down i know i'm i'm doing something right yeah you're having a big carryover and more importantly they're being much more conscientious outside of your, uh, your, your training time with them. So they're, they're yeah. continuing to take that into their own practice. Yeah, it's a process because of course it's not, uh, ingrained in them yet. So you have to constantly remind them. Mm-hmm. And as I always say, the best thing that I could probably do is lead by example. So whenever I would, uh, be there, I would purposely also guide them through the movement and demonstrate it. Cause you could say, you could tell them, uh, you're supposed to do this till you're blue in the face, but if you can't show them how it's done, it's a different thing. But if you show them how it's done, guide them through, then for some of them, they kind of take it as a challenge because they see, oh man, my coach is old, way older than me and he, he can do it almost effortlessly. So then they start doing in the repetitions, becoming more conscious, and then they start to do it. And then when they start to do it, then they, they see it and they feel the, when they start feeling the benefits then they realize, oh, no wonder why coach was telling me to do that. So I think that's one way I'm, I'm really trying to uh, incorporate some things is by showing it, it to them and then making them understand and making them feel the benefit. Because if you can make someone feel the benefit, it would stick with them rather than if they only hear the benefit. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think what you're you're really touching on there is that uh, it, it it can take some time for for buy in to occur. You, you need to yeah. kind of sometimes win over a client or an athlete uh, so that they believe in you know the the program that they're going through with with you. Yeah. Um, and it, it, sometimes that that happens a little bit more with the younger ones than the more experienced ones. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it takes time. It definitely takes time. And th sometimes we, uh, what I would some, sometimes do is that when we are going for a warm up, sometimes I would try to make them purposely laugh on purpose, like crack a joke or something. Because we all know that laughter is also medicine. And the less stressful the environment would be when we're training, it would be more fun. So, like, w one of my favorite uh, things that we all, that always happens whenever we're crawling like the last time is when they were crawling on the bench, the ones who finished first while waiting for the others, they were like making cat sounds or making cat gestures. So it was all fun and we were laughing. <laughs> That's so, awesome. uh, yeah, it was for me that I, I actually encourage that because if it's a playful environment, then of course they could learn more and it, it could be more, uh, it could also be more stimulating. Right. And that, and that goes back to the distress and you stress, right? So yeah, exactly. So if they're having fun, they're absorbing, they're getting a good, you know, training session in, um, they don't feel like there's this environment that has a lot of tension and negativity to it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And sometimes when we were, when we were also going through the warm up or we're going through the drills, some of the assistant boxing coaches go through it as well. So it's also fun and laughter because they would also like crack jokes with the coach. Hey, you can't do it. And then after a while, oh, but you, I, mine looks better than yours. So all in all, we're all learning from each other. Yeah. And that's, that's what it's all about, right? Helping, helping others and making sure that people are improving and learning. Oh yeah, definitely. It's always, it's all about the learning. Awesome. So, uh, I got some, some questions specifically for you. Um, sure. so not for your clients or, um, athletes, what, what's your personal, um, go to or favorite strength training exercise? Right now I would say I'd be very biased. I would say original strength. And then I would say uh, body a lot of body weight stuff. So the one arm push up or one arm one leg and the pistols. Yeah, yeah and, so, and of course, don't forget the pull ups. And the pull ups. Awesome. Do you do you uh, mix in the handstand push ups or handstands in there as well? Yeah, actually, here's a little story about uh, handstand push ups. My best presses, as far as I can recall, always came when I was able to work up to getting to a certain volume and working up to a certain deficit with handstand push-ups. That's when I, my best presses were always around because uh, I remember when uh, for SFG2, I needed to press a 32 since I'm, on, I'm, I'm 150 pounds when I'm heavy and I'm under 150 when I'm lighter. So when I was doing handstand push-ups often last, around this time last year, I was able to press a 36 for uh, two reps if I remember it right. Wow. That's, that's incredible. So you saw a ton of carryover to your pressing strength because of the handstand pushup. Yeah. Yep. Did you find, I'm just curious, um, did you find the handstand pushup carried over more compared to the, the one arm pushup or one arm, one leg or For single bell, uh, pressing, I would say yes and no. It, all right. Let me, uh, allow me to elaborate a little bit more. The one arm push up and the one arm one leg push up, they tend to teach me, and uh, I think for a lot of people, if you ask them, how to link up and zip up to stay tight. And I think that's mm -hmm. what uh, where a lot of us struggle with when we're pressing a heavy bell is we tend to lose tension once the bell gets in motion. Now, for the handstand push up, it tends to develop better pressing strength. So that's what I would that's what I would say. Right. That's a great, that's a great point. Uh, and a huge differentiation between the two because that zipping up or that linking, you need to have mm -hmm. basically that, that line of tension, you know, from your foot through, through your hand for the, for the yep. push up that we're talking about. And then the yeah, handstand exactly. push up, you're moving your entire body weight. Um, yeah, that's great. That's, that's very cool. 
So hopefully everybody out there that's going to be listening to this can, can see some benefit and value in potentially adding um, either, you know, the one arm push up or handstand push ups into their own personal practice and having that carrying over to uh, their military press or any pressing. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, one thing that I think that a lot of people should focus on when it comes to the one arm push up, if you would allow me to elaborate, is as you come up, you want to stay tight and maintain the tension. Mm-hmm. This will definitely help when it comes to pressing the heavy bell. Right. Because as soon as you lose that tension, it's an opportunity for the for the energy to leak out of the body. There you go. Awesome. Okay, so another question. Uh, this is just geared geared towards you. Um, it's 2016. If you could go back in time, ten years ago, and meet yourself, what advice would you give yourself ten years ago? Number one. Um, Assuming I could travel back in time and bring some stuff with me, I would definitely bring some kettlebells. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, that would be one. Number two, number, and of course, I would also tell myself to learn how to stay uh, in at the edge of the comfort zone more rather than really trying to push the limit. I mean, I had really great programs back then because uh, 2006 was, I would say, my my first phase when things just I started to make a lot of sense in terms of training. I hit a lot of PRs then, but I was not, I was focusing too much on the program rather than the principles. That's a great point. Can you, can you expand on that? Because I think I know where you're going with this, but I, I want to hear you, yeah. you talk about it. Yeah. Like for example, uh, let's say I was doing a program and it would be a six week or a 12 week program. And you see these numbers and you think that these numbers are ar- arbitrary in order for you to get get to po- from point A to point B. Now, when and when I didn't get it, I got frustrated. So rather than uh, focusing on the arbitrary numbers, what I would tell myself, is, look, why not just focus on, let's say you're trying to get uh, to a 315 uh, back squat. You're doing 260 right now. But the 260 that you did for, let's say, five reps, you got it, but you were struggling by the fifth rep. Why not just... Focus on making those five reps almost flawless. Then you know that you're, you've definitely gotten stronger, but you didn't really have to chase the number. Rather, you focus on the quality of each repetition. Because if you could make your first rep to your last rep of a set look exactly the same, you know you've gotten stronger. Great. So to summarize, making sure that the quality of the last repetition of the set matches the quality of the first repetition of that set. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, another example I could give you like right now, if I would still to think about things, uh, in terms of numbers, I'm probably not at my strongest right now. But one thing I noticed is let's say I am pressing a 32 right now. I, I regained my 32 press just recently. And the amount of effort I needed to press the 32 before required me to use full f- feed forward tension and I needed to use my use power breathing. Of course, for those who are listeners who are not familiar, these are concepts taught at any strong first course or certification. Uh, but when I pressed the 32 left and right, I did not require any uh, power breathing. I just had to zip up a bit, but not as tight as I normally did before, and I got the bell up. So that means I'm getting stronger slowly but surely. Right, and that's and that's some of the things that you've talked to me about is you're developing more of that strength, more of that reflex, of course, stability, and you have the ability to really dial up the tension more if you need it. Mm-hmm. But as you get stronger, you don't, you don't need to, you sort of have a, a stronger base level and yeah. y- you, uh, you can tap into it anytime you want. Yeah. And uh, to, uh, to further elaborate, another thing I might uh, do is if I could go back in time, I would probably explain to my, for my younger self then, because I did get uh, to skim through the Naked Warrior back then, and I would elaborate how Grease the Groove really worked, that it's not supposed to be fixated. You're not so, it's not to be, supposed to be fixated on the numbers rather than the quality of the reps. That's the one thing I would do, because we all, most of us in the Strong First community know that that's one of Pavel's gems, mm-hmm. Grease the Groove, but sometimes it's kind of, since it's kind of vague, 
some people don't get it. So I would definitely elaborate uh, that to my former self, considering that at that time, 2006, I was still apprenticing at the gym where I work for right now. So I had a lot of time on my hands. So I could have probably just uh, greased the groove with, uh, for a certain uh, movement of my choice back then. And I would have probably been getting really strong. Wow, that's that's a great point, and that's definitely some advice that I'll be putting into use myself because uh, I have the Naked Warrior, the the book, and the DVD, and preparing for the the uh, the SFB certification. Um, but it's so easy to get caught up in the number of reps, but always to remember, yeah, you know, focus quality over the quantity, uh, because yeah. you know, at the end of the day, what are you teaching yourself? You know, what are you learning? Um, mm-hmm. And there's an element of trust to that, right? So you have to kind of play the yeah. the long term game where you know that at the end of the day, if you keep up with this and put the time in, it's going to pay off in the end. Yeah, it's about trusting the process. Yes, awesome. Um, okay, so I think you kind of touched on this a little bit in your answer, um, but try to go in a little bit more detail. How how's your training? changed presently compared to 10 years ago uh were you using different tools same tools has the programming changed um are you are you much more disciplined um could you could you speak to that a little bit i just hope i uh, i just hope that by now i probably learned more discipline i really hope so but i've been doing a lot more kettlebells now than i have back then of course because they weren't available to me then and i'm also uh doing a lot more uh original strengths because i i'm starting to finally see how it works that's what i would say because i i had the book in i think 2013 if i remember it right but i still did not fully grasp the potential of it but only after doing it more and actually putting it under a, a lens and trying to dissect it did i understand see the, the power of the concept and the system that i'm starting to use it a lot more now uh what else do, do did i change um i would focus a lot more on a precision of technique now mm-hmm. versus back then that sometimes even if i have to if i did i the program says three reps but i know that the third rep would be a grinder i'd stay with two one or two and just focus on making that almost effortless what else wow, i, I learned to listen to my body a lot more oh sorry what was that I just learned to listen to my body a lot more now because yeah. you can't keep on uh, flooring it, especially as, you know, I think what's one thing is as you get older, you, you you should be able to increase the level of wisdom. It should not be stagnant. Wow. That's, that's great. That's some, uh, that's some good perspective. Yeah. And I totally agree. I know that as I'm getting older, it's, uh, it's much more important to um, listen to your body. It's not always easy. Yeah. It's it's mm-hmm. something that is constantly uh, being put into practice and continuing to evolve. Um, but I definitely yeah. listen much more and better than than I used to ten years ago. Um, and I think it takes sometimes it takes the bad experiences or the bad you know training sessions and making mistakes or getting injured to to learn from that. Yeah, as they say, it, uh, if you make a mistake, as the, the one thing that you should do is learn from it and correct yourself. Uh, one of my coaches in basketball in high school, if I remember it right, would always say, don't apologize if you make a mistake. Hustle back down back down to the court and make up for it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's only a mistake if you don't learn from it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, Mark, so have you had any injuries um, over the course of your career? And if so, uh, what were they and how did they change your your training or approach to training all right this is a very good question in fact i hurt my shoulder two years ago around this time wow happy second anniversary shoulder it's my left one actually uh (laughs) i had a rotator cuff impingement and i got from trying to be too aggressive in my pressing because at that time i was uh trying to get strong so that i could automatically press my level two press belt for the sfg2 and what happened was I was fortunate enough that one of my uh, business partners and colleagues, uh, Jay Lopez, is also an occupational therapist. So I called him up 
and at that time uh, he had a, a private facility of his own that he that he managed, and I would uh, sometimes train people there. So he was very generous to help me out and help me heal my shoulder. Wow. Um, do you have any? Do you have any recurring issues, or are you completely healthy now? Yeah. Well, I would say right now I'm perfectly healthy. I think I was three weeks ago. I was feeling like I might have a shoulder injury coming up, so I was. I was, I was just. Uh, I sent a text message to Jay. Dude, stand by. I might be bugging you in a, in a few days. And then he said, "Sure." Then, fortunately, I mean, I just did a lot more original strength resets i did a lot more uh segmental rolling a lot more backward crawling and some uh rocking and i mean the 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 discomfort just went away now uh another thing i can say one thing that can also prevent you from uh having any injuries is sometimes you need to hire a coach sometimes you need someone to write your own program so that per you so that person is holding you accountable and at the same time you have to be a good it forces you to be a good student and follow the program as written because when we're writing our own programs sometimes we tend to get carried away we tend to think of ourselves mm-hmm. as uh, super super men or super women that we forget that we are also uh vulnerable and we will break yeah and, and it there's a ton of value in having somebody else uh coach you or write your own program because yeah definitely you know it gives you different perspective it opens you up to different different exercises, different training approaches, um, you know, and, and you, you're continuing to develop, um, you know, your own skill sets, both as an athlete and, and a coach. Yeah. Cause you learn something, you learn a different approach to how you would be writing a program since you see a different, uh, perspective and that also expands your toolbox, as you just said, or sharpens your blade. Okay. That's right. And it's all about learning. That's awesome. Um, Okay, so so last question here. So, uh, you work. Uh, we've touched on with you know the junior boxers and then the older ones. Overall, in your opinion, is there uh, one thing that you know all junior athletes, regardless of the sport, they should be um, integrating into their into their uh, training for their sports to you know complement uh, their performance and their health? Yeah, good question. Number one. Always listen to your body. L- remember that there's a difference between fight time and training time. So you don't always have to try to beast in the in in the gym. Number one, or when you're doing your your skill skills uh, practice when you're sparring, it's don't always think that you have to knock out your sparring partner. Remember, if you lose one sparring partner, that means one less person to work with. So practice the, the technique and. Those knockouts will come if you're if you're a boxer or if you're a wrestler. The pins will come, the takedowns will come. Practice the practice the proficiency of the skill, and you will get better. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, don't neglect taking care of your body when you're doing your strength and conditioning sessions. Put value into that because that will help your body be able to handle the rigors of your training. The more healthier you are, the more training you can get in. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, because health is so important, right? That it, yeah. it's usually lost as we're pursuing the either the goals of strength or for fitness, and that's yeah. usually put towards the backseat. But it, it's yes. very much should be right there next to those other two. Yes, uh, one of my favorite quotes that I got from one of our uh, teachers in the Strong First community, Doctor Mark Cheng, is "You want to punch the envelope, not tear it." Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, I think I've heard you say that one other time. I didn't realize that was from Dr. Chang. That's awesome. That's a good one. Um, so, Mark, we are we're just uh, right around the hour mark right now. So we've uh, we've covered a ton of ground uh, this evening. Uh, lots of information, um, you know, for for the audience regarding uh, training for for boxing or um, you know any any fighting sports. Uh, your approach. Um, you know, working with uh, athletes across multiple uh, age groups and ability levels. Um, you know, uh, awesome. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to, uh, to share your uh, wisdom and knowledge. As always, it's a pleasure to uh, be invited here. And it's always a pleasure to share my knowledge with others. I personally had a lot of uh, hurdles to uh, go, o- go over since I am here in the Philippines and 
training uh, resources are not readily available. So it's the least, of, least that I could do if I could help others here or a- anywhere in the world who's listening to this podcast. I'm I'm sure that I've, I've done something great in this world. Yeah, you definitely have. Thank you so much. And uh, why don't you just hang on the line and I'll, uh, I'll give you a proper goodbye. Um, and then sure. we'll, we'll wrap up. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.